Hi, welcome to the lecture on the preface to Lyrical Ballads. So you have this PowerPoint loaded up in Brightspace. Uh, under the Romantic Movement module, you'll see a submodule called Preface Lyrical Ballads. It's, it's in there. Um, and so uh, you can follow along. You can print this out if you want. Let me go to this. All right, so uh, Lyrical Ballads was first published in 1798 by Wordsworth and Coleridge. And at that time, in that edition, it just inc included the collection of poetry. There were four poems by Coleridge, including Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and the rest, the, the considerable amount of the rest, were by Wordsworth, right? In eight, the 1800 edition, they added the preface. And in the 1802 edition, they added a revised press, preface. Now, when I say they, um, really Wordsworth, right? If you'll notice, the um, this is the, the front cover of the first edition. You'll see it, um, actually it has, this one you can't see in the bottom, but it has uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge's name. In the 1800 and the 1802 edition, it just has Wordsworth's name, and that was with Coleridge's approval. Um, again, the primary work is Wordsworth. Now, Wordsworth and Coleridge are kind of like an odd couple, Oscar and Felix with, um, you know, Coleridge kind of being Oscar and uh, Wordsworth being Felix. Um, it's, it's a strange partnership um, because they were quite different. Um, and we see some of those differences coming out in the preface where Wordsworth kind of criticizes Coleridge and kind of this loose, you know, over-emotional kind of language he uses. And then Coleridge kind of criticizes Wordsworth in some of his writings for, you know, writing without passion. Um, and so um, it's it's interesting that they ever found any common ground. Um, but the suggestion to write the preface was um, Coleridge's, right? That after the 1798 edition came out, their writings, their poems were ridiculed, they were mocked, uh, people didn't understand them. And so Coleridge says, you know, we ought to write down what our philosophy, what our reasons were in putting together this ballad, what we think poetry needs to, to be, right? And Wordsworth agreed. And Coleridge said, oh, and I'll do it, which made sense because Coleridge is still esteemed as a critical analyst, right? We still read his criticisms on Shakespeare. We still read his Biographia Literaria, which you read one of those things for your uh, as your assignments, right? But Coleridge just wouldn't do it. Um, and so pretty quickly, Wordsworth had to put something together for the 1800 edition. So he really needed to revise it for 1802, right? The fourth bullet point there, uh, I can't stress enough. This is one of the most important works, one of the most influential works in English language. And I even think it goes beyond just the English language because we know that like the French symbolists were highly influenced by the Romantics. Uh, and so it, they just totally changed the way we saw poetry and what poetry can be. Um, and it's never really fallen out of fashion. I mean, yes, there have been new moment movements. There have been movements that have moved against kind of that. Once we get to the 20th century with T.S. Eliot, we're going to be seeing someone who rejects the idea of common topics in ordinary language and poetry accessible to uh, just anybody. He's, he's a total elitist. And so there's a little movement there, um, you know, but there's still people who are writing in the romantic tradition today and the things that they changed for poetry, the way they opened it up, it's just, you can't, can't let that cat, can't get that cat back in the bag, right? Um, Coleridge in uh, his later writings tell us that he and Wordsworth, when they were in Somerset in the Lake Country deciding, talking about this new ideas they had for poetry and all that, they decided that Coleridge would write the romantic, supernatural, fantastical kind of writings, which the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and Kubla Khan definitely are good, you know, uh, examples of that. And Wordsworth would write about the ordinary, everyday life, right? Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later here, later, uh, about why he wanted to write about that, right? Okay, so important concepts in the preface, and this just is really 
hitting the biggies. There's so much more to read there. But one of the first things is that I think at times, and I'm not the only one, this is, uh, you know, stuff that most people think about. There seems to be, especially at the beginning and then at the end, this argument that he's making for this new style of poetry, that he's oftentimes trying to excuse it. Uh, and so he calls it an experiment, but he doesn't really tell us all of the reasons. He kind of cops out. He says, there's so many nuanced and complex reasons why we need a new poetry, uh, but I'll explain just some of them to help people understand, right? Um, he does defend himself from the, or, and, and Coleridge from the accusation of being just lazy, like, oh, well, sure, you just want to throw out all the rules because it's easy to write poetry if you don't have to follow any rules, right? Well, he says, no, he says, every generation rejects and accepts different poetic forms. He says, um, you know, I'm trying to create a new type of poetry. And he wasn't alone. There were other people trying to do new things as well. Most of them just didn't catch on, right? Um, so again, he wants to make sure people know that it's not laziness that has him trying these new things, right? For the subjects, um, and this is what I was talking about, we're going to come back a little bit, why these ordinary events, right? Um, and again, remember, he is writing this, not Coleridge, and so that's why we don't have a big discussion of the supernatural here, because this is really about Wordsworth's beliefs, and he and Coleridge differed quite greatly on some things, but he says, he wanted to focus on common, everyday, ordinary events. For him, that was where people were the most true, right? Uh, honest, they were more aware of themselves, doing these day-to-day -day things. And he thought that was why it was um, suitable for poetry, right? Um, and he didn't want to write in a very ostentatious manner. So in terms of language of poetry, he believed that it should be written as close to the common language, what he called the peasantry, I believe, as possible. Though, you know, you might have to make some modifications to avoid vulgarity or, or something like that, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And then he argues that, again, in response to the neoclassical era, he says that the problem with the poetry that was current or that had come before was that it was written for, you know, people with advanced uh, education, with high levels of literacy, that the language became a barrier and that he wanted to make his poetry accessible to all people. And he also said that, you know, the common language is actually longer lasting. It was more permanent and it was closer to nature because it didn't have all of these rules and, you know, artifices about it. When defining the poet, he said that he is a man speaking to men, right? This was also quite revolutionary in that it democratized poetry, right? He's not speaking to other poets, to other people in his class. He's speaking to everyone. Um, and when it comes to the idea of he's a man speaking to men, we don't know if he really meant only men should be poets. Um, he did support his sister Dorothy's writings, though she really just wrote journals, prose. She didn't dabble too much in poetry. So we don't know if he if he really, what he thought much about women poets, but um, he might have just been using men there in the gender neutral way that men has been used for most of human history, right? Purpose of poetry, again, a big split from what we see before. Wordsworth criticizes the poetry of the day and the neoclassical era, he says it's about trivial things, right? They don't have a worthy po purpose, right? Um, oftentimes, it's like the poets just write just to show how clever they are. There's no depth. And he says poems should be serious and they should be insightful. They should bring together emotion and thought, right? A lot of neoclassical era poetry is just about thought. It's about cleverness and being able to follow the rules and, and do those kind of things, right? And for Wordsworth, it's clear that he actually thinks emotion is the most important of the two, because without emotion, you can't have true, honest thought, that it's that emotional connection that opens us up to the truths of nature, right? And so this next second point, probably the most famous of Wordsworth's precepts when it comes to writing poetry. He says that the sponta uh, poetry is the spontaneous overflow of emotions or powerful feelings 
later recollected in tranquility. And so what he means by that, there's, there's a really kind of a twofold meaning. One is for the poet and one is for the reader. So for the poet, poets should not write their poetry at the moment that they have these intense emotional experiences, that they need to go home and think about it and ponder and in tranquility write, right? Because, and, and that makes sense, right? I mean, we've all been in a situation where we say, hey, we need to just stop and cool our heads out, right? Cool heads, right? We're too emotional. We're too close to it. We can't really see it. And so this is something that's very important. The second aspect of this that's more connected to the reader is that when recollecting those emotions, whether it be your own experiences or maybe reading poetry that someone else has written, right, that you can actually find tranquility. You can find ease to your heartache or your pain or your sorrow or your grief or whatever's going on by reliving these moments, right? Um, and so he says, um, the rest of the quote, emotion is contemplated till by a species of reaction, the tranquility gradually disappears and an emotion similar to that which was before the subject of contemplation is gradually produced and does itself actually exist in the mind. So you have this experience, it's very emotional. You come back, you meditate if you will, you calm yourself down, you think about it, and then you recover that experience because it always lives up here. And so this is the power of the poetic imagination, the power of observing and being close to nature that you can access those memories again and, and, and feel enough of the experience that it can help ease whatever you're feeling, right? He, he does criticize a lot of poetry written at the time because he says that they're trying to create excitement. They're trying to create emotional responses from readers by using cheap tricks, right? That they use violence or excessive melodrama or something like that, as opposed to really connecting to the truth of nature and relying on people's reason to make those connections and then feel excitement in that connection, in the truth that's revealed, right? Even in these ordinary events that are themselves not, you know, super, super exciting. Part of that, that, that choice then in terms of how you evoke emotion is the type of language you use. And so Wordsworth believed that in terms of diction and style, you should use simple language. You shouldn't write about so many abstract concepts, things that are so metaphorical or elusive that people don't get what they are. You should be careful about figures of speech. And so we see very little allegory or, or deep metaphor or symbolism in his works. There is some. But most of it's pretty straightforward. It's not the kind of stuff that you have to look at like, oh, why is he talking about this person? Who was this person? What is this historical event? Um, he doesn't layer his works with those kind of things. We're going to see Keats is probably the worst, if we want to use say worst of doing this. He is highly elusive. He is highly symbolic and abstract. And we have other writers that are like that. But Wordsworth, you should be able to read most of what he wrote and pretty much get it, right? Some of it's a little bit more challenging than others, but once you understand what he's talking about, you see that in the poem and, and it's expressed very simply, right? Uh, he also says something that's quite contrary to the theory of the time, which is that poetry can be prose-like, that there's nothing wrong with it sounding like natural speech. Now, he loved rhyme and meter. I mean, he adores it. And so he uses rhythm and meter and rhyme, um, not for all of his poems in terms of rhyme, but he uses that, but he still manages to write his poems in the way that actually sound very much like regular speech. Um, and so again, this is one of those differences, right, in the Romantic movement. Nature and poetry. Okay, so nature, big, big thing for the romantics. Nature, obviously in the sense of being surrounded by the nature, being out of the city, but also nature in the more spiritual sense, right? A lot of romantics 
were pantheists, right? That's that they believed in worshiping nature because nature was the physical manifestation of God and his power, right? It didn't mean that they weren't Christian. They just felt that in nature, God is expressing his presence and we shouldn't be moving away from nature. We should be moving closer to it. We should live in harmony with it. And so for Wordsworth, the most perfect topic for writing about is something that takes place in nature. And we're going to see that many of the poets in the romantic era adhere to this. Uh, some you're going to see nature much more prevalent than others, but there always is the sense of being connected to the world around us, right? This is a reaction to that urbanism of neoclassicism that saw the city as the center of everything and had great pride in, in all of the advancements of humans and things like that. Um, Wordsworth says nature, the city harms people because it divorces us self, our, ourselves from our truth, our true selves. It dulls our mind, right? Um, in the sonnets, uh, The World is Too Much With Us in London, 1802, we see this really probably best articulated about the, the way the city is so harmful, right? Um, in other poems, there's there's a long poem. It's not in our book. I don't know why it's not in the book. It's one of, I think, one of the essential words where it's called Ode Intimations of Immortality. It is a long, long poem, I will admit. But he really clarifies his idea about this connection between nature. In uh, one of our other poems that we're reading, um, he does have the line, child is father to the man. And that is a hint of what he's talking about. But in Ode to Int Ode Intimations of Immortality, he gives this very clear philosophy about children and, and, and growing and, and all of that. And so he says that, you know, when we're children, we are close to nature. We, we have very little artifice, if, if none at all. We say what we think. We act the way we feel. We're honest and we're so close to nature. And we experience nature in a very different way than we do as adults. Because as we grow older, society puts all these rules on us. Oh, no, you're not supposed to laugh inside the house. You're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to do that. You know, you're supposed to act this way. Um, we put on a mask, right? We're not supposed to show our true selves in society. We're supposed to show whatever society wants us to see, right? And this leads to depravity, right? Because we're cutting ourselves off from the very truths of how we're supposed to be, right? And so it's easier for people to get farther and farther away from, you know, good behavior. And the city encourages that, right? And so this is why the city is... You know, I would—I don't know that you would say evil, but it's—it's it's bad, right? And that again is the role of the poet to help people in the city. There are a lot of people who can't go to can't go to the country, right? They can't escape. They don't have the money and all that. So poetry is a way for these people to reconnect with nature, to avoid the moral problems, the depravity that people fall into in the city because they're cut off from that, right? Um, and, and that's, of course, this, this idea of the poet as being an arbiter of social reform, of justice, of morality. Uh, you know, Shelley says that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, right? Because they see nature as it is. They understand this, and it's their job to make sure that people understand it who can't understand it on their own, right? That is our presentation. And we're now going to move on to um, Coleridge, I mean Wordsworth, and then Coleridge.